Benjamin, the Executive Director of the American Public Health Association. I want to thank you for joining us this evening for the environmental justice from the grassroots to the White House celebration. Our mission is to improve the health of the public and achieve equity in health status. In order to achieve health equity, we must address the environmental injustices caused by environmental racism. Communities of color and low-income communities continue to experience the negative health impacts of environmental health hazards driven by past and current day discriminatory pra practices and policies, such as the location of toxic waste sites and landfills. Tonight, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the first National People of Color Environmental Health Leadership Summit. The summit had a lasting and meaningful impact on the environmental justice movement, emphasizing self-determination of all peoples and led to a formal declaration of the 17 principles of environmental justice. Tonight, you will hear from leaders within the movement reflect on the past three decades and the future of the environmental justice movement. On behalf of APHA, I want to thank the presenters, the United Church of Christ, and the APHA Environment and Occupational Health and Safety Sections for organizing tonight's celebration. We hope to continue to engage in meaningful dialogue and drive support and action towards environmental justice. Thank you again. Oh, and what? Thank you, Dr. Benjamin, for those opening remarks. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the 1991 First National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. Tonight is a time for celebration and reflection. We are looking forward to a vibrant discussion, including where the movement has been and where we can go. I'm Rebecca Rear, Director of Climate for Health at EcoAmerica and a member of APHA's Environment Section and Environmental Justice Committee. Thank you to our co-hosts, the American Public Health Association, the United Church of Christ, and APHA Environment and Occupational Health and Safety Sections. On behalf of the Planning Committee for this event, I am very pleased to welcome you all here tonight and to join you virtually from Nakachank and Piscataway land. Today, we have a celebratory and educational evening planned with an incredible speaker lineup and clips from the 1991 summit. Before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items. First, closed captioning is available for this webinar. Instructions for accessing closed captioning are in the chat. This webinar is being recorded. All registrants will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording within the next two weeks. We encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A function. The chat function is disabled for participants and is used for announcements only. We do have a pretty packed agenda, so time for Q&A will be limited, but we will get to as many of your questions as we can. At the end of this webinar, you will be directed to a survey please take a moment to fill out this quick questionnaire to help us improve our future webinars. You can follow the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag EJ, the number four all, so EJ for all. Please share your takeaways and sentiments. We welcome open discourse. Today, you will be welcomed by our co-hosts, followed by an opening keynote address from White House Council on Environmental Quality Chair, Brenda Mallory, then we will move into our panel discussion, after which we will remember those who have been part of the environmental justice movement and are no longer with us. And we will close out the evening with a keynote address from Black Millennials for Flint founder, CEO, and President Latricia Adams. And with that, it is my honor to introduce Reverend, Reverend Brooks Berndt, Minister for Environmental Justice at the United Church of Christ. Reverend Berndt, over to you. Thank you, Rebecca. It is with a heart full of gratitude that I join all of you tonight. I am grateful to be with each and every one of you, and I am grateful for what we are here to celebrate. I am reminded of a book title by the late great historian of movements, Vincent Hardy. He wrote a book called There Is a River. And for him, a movement was, a river was a metaphor for a movement. And certainly indeed, rivers are movements and, and their waters extend from the past to the present. Sometimes they rush like a torrent and sometimes they're congested with obstacles 
I think we recently experienced a few years of congestion, about four years. But the river is always flowing and it's always a life-giving gift to us all. Tonight, we are here to celebrate an event that would have made the prophet Amos proud as he spoke of justice that rolls down like waters. So I'm especially grateful tonight for the wave makers from whom we will hear. They have been making waves for more than 30 years and their waves are still carrying us forward. I feel like clapping already. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce the next person from whom you will hear. Brenda Mallory was confirmed by the United States Senate on April 14th, 2021, and sworn in as the 12th chair of the Council on Environmental Quality. She is the first African-American to serve in this position. As chair, she advises the president on environmental policies and improve, preserve, and protect public health and the environment for our nation's communities. She is focused particularly on addressing environmental justice and climate change challenges while advancing opportunities for job growth and economic development. Chair Mallory, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for that warm welcome. It is such a, such a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I, am, I can't even tell you how excited it is for me to help uh, be part of a celebration of a 30 year fight for environmental justice. I'm tremendously honored to be part of an administration that is prioritizing climate action, equity and environmental justice. But before I get into the specifics about what, what, what we're doing right now, I just wanna talk a little bit about how we got here. It's especially fitting to take a quick look at our past since pioneers of the environmental justice movement are here today and participating in this program. These courageous individuals have been raising alarm bells for decades that pollution disproportionately harms black, brown, tribal, and low-income communities. Today, the principles of environmental justice have become a key element of our policy discussions at the White House and in our classrooms. Yes, the environmental justice movement has come a long way, but we have a long way to go. And I think those of us here today know that. Um, but it's important to pause in any case and to recognize the milestone that was achieved uh, 30 years ago uh, and to recognize those who have paved the way and provided tools to kind of mobilize against injustice and provided the platform to amplify the voices of impacted communities, particularly those of color. The origin of the environmental justice movement is a story of resilience. It reflects the power of collective action and the actions of a courageous few. We often mark the early 1980s as the beginning of this movement, but some experts note that there were seeds for this movement planted in the 1960s. At our traditional starting point, the state of North Carolina decided to develop a hazardous waste facility in Afton, a small town in Warren County, North Carolina. Through direct nonviolent action, people of all creeds, races, and walks of life joined the predominantly Black residents of Warren County to protest its construction. Although the landfill was ultimately built, the events in Warren County were a turning point. The sustained action had profound impacts on the national conscience and propelled issues of environmental racism into the national spotlight. Following the events in Warren County, momentum was harnessed to host the first people, National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit, where the 17 principles of environmental justice were first articulated. In the following year, Dr. Bob Bullard released his book, Dumping in Dixie, which amplified the events in Warren County, but perhaps most importantly, it spoke truth to power. In 1992, the late Congressman John Lewis introduced the Environmental Justice Act, the first ever piece of legislation dedicated to rooting out environmental injustice. That same year, President Clinton signed Executive Order 12898 on environmental justice. By this time, there was strong evidence that the legal and policy choices 
uh, the, that legal and policy choices were being made that resulted in the most polluting uses and facilities being concentrated in poor communities and communities of color. In the nearly 30 years in between, an intergenerational movement of activists, community members and leaders, local and state officials, and many members of Congress have continued to push environmental justice onto the agenda. So it is not a mere afterthought for policymakers. While these hard won victories marked a turning point for our nation, the path to achieving these milestones included plenty of disappointments and setbacks along the way. And as I said at the start, the fight for environmental justice continues. The pandemic placed a powerful spotlight on the consequences of years of environmental injustice. We have seen Black Americans and other people of color dying at a faster rate from COVID, partly because of the higher rates of long-term exposure to air pollution. That has served as a catalyst in expanding the range of voices calling for issues of environmental injustice to be addressed. And that's why at the White House, we are taking a whole of government approach to these issues. Our goal at CEQ is to work so that every person can drink clean water, breathe clean air, and live in a healthy community. While these are our values, we know this is not a reality for all communities. I recently traveled to one of those communities uh, that is suffering. Zip code 48217 in Detroit, Michigan is the most polluted zip code in the state of Michigan. I met with longtime residents turned activists who have been fighting for years to raise awareness that the toxic pollution from a large number of polluting facilities in their neighborhood is poisoning their children, their families, and their community. Correcting these historic wrongs will require a long-term commitment and strong partnerships at the federal, state, and local levels. President Biden created the first ever White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council as one tool to help tackle this, these systemic problems. This council is made up of 26 longtime environmental justice advocates and experts from all across the country, including Dr. Bullard. We know it is critical that we hear directly from communities on the ground so that we can make change on the ground that will affect their lives. President Biden has made clear that his administration will chart a new and better course, one that puts environmental and economic justice at the center of all we do. Our Justice 40 initiative is a critical component to charting this better course. President Biden's commitment to deliver 40% of the benefits of federal climate and infrastructure investments to disadvantaged communities is historic. Justice 40 will also allow us to look at how certain federal programs work and strive to ensure that all communities are receiving the benefits intended. As we focus on implementation, we must ask ourselves, how do we get help on the ground to communities like those in Southwest Detroit and too many others around the country who have suffered from pollution and disinvestment for too long? In July, we took a key step towards achieving the president's goal by releasing interim implementation guidance for the Justice 40 initiative. This guidance, which we will update as we move forward, provides initial direction for how agencies should determine which programs are covered, measure and track benefits for those programs, and engage with the public and communities. The task of transforming longstanding federal programs to ensure that 40% of investment benefits reach disadvantaged communities is unprecedented and challenging which is why the interim guidance also identifies 21 programs across nine federal agencies to serve as pilot programs for the Justice 40 initiative. This will help us develop and understand best practices that we can apply to the implementation of Justice 40 in other programs across the government. We must incorporate equity for overburdened and underserved communities in climate policies. This we know. As I said, the EJ movement has truly gone from grassroots to the White House, to right here in the White House. 
In close, uh, I'm sorry, I'll close with a story from another uh, recent trip of mine, this time to Tacoma, Washington. I was visiting a schoolyard that is um, being restored to bring more green space into a community that um, lacked access to nature. One of the third grade students who uh, helped design the new schoolyard was, was doing research about me prior to, to my visit. She asked her teacher the night before uh, if I really worked in the White House. Her teacher said yes. And the little girl's response was, she looks like me. It was clearly impactful for her to realize that maybe one day she too could work in the White House. I loved hearing this story. What a, what a great reminder of the importance of having diverse leaders. It reminded me of how important it is that we have the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council advising us in the White House. Diverse voices impacting policy choices. Finally, it reminded me of how our work at CEQ and the White House can really be impactful. Because of the diverse set of opinions, backgrounds, and experiences we are bringing into policy decision making, we have a chance to make a real difference in people's lives. And that's what I get excited about. One of my favorite Maya Angelou quotes, which you've probably heard me recite if you've heard me speak recently, <clears throat> excuse me. Just lost my place. <clears throat> Um, uh, reads, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. We know better. It's long past time to do better. That's what this is about. How do we build clean energy out in a better way? How do we make sure our federal investments are actually reaching the communities they are designed to help? How do we tackle the climate crisis while also recognizing that its impacts do not affect all of us equally? How do we ensure everyone can reap the benefits from the clean energy economy? That is our challenge and we must do better, but we can't do it without partners like you and everyone who helped pave the way for environmental justice. So I thank you, I honor all those who were involved in the early days and have been fighting for the last 30 years. And I look forward to continuing to work with you going forward. So thanks for inviting me to join you today. Thank you very much, Chair Mallory. Thank you so much for your sentiments, your unwavering leadership that this administration is taking to prioritize climate change, equity, environmental justice, and your marks are a resounding call to action. And to hear it straight from the White House provides the impetus for us all to carry the drumbeat. So we really appreciate you joining us here today. As we know, great leadership begets great leaders. So we really appreciate you. And thank you for your sentiments and words and leadership as a whole. Hi everyone, I am Dr. Crystal Epperman. I am the Vice President of to be here today to facilitate and share this moment with you, all in the audience and our lineup of panelists. As someone who has been in the environmental movement for a really long time, since the age of 15, many of the folks we have here today have blazed a trail that is truly inspiring and I have the honor and pleasure of introducing them to you today. This evening, we are joined by Mr. Charles Lee, who is the Senior Policy Advisor at the EPA's Office of Environmental Justice. We also have joining us today, Dr. Linda Ray Murray, who is the past president of the American Public Association. Next, we have Mrs. Leslie Fields, Senior Director for Environmental Justice and Healthy Communities at the Sierra Club. And last but not least, Mrs. Vernice Miller-Travis, who is an executive vice president at the Metropolitan Group. Thank you all for joining us today, panelists. On this precipitous occasion, I can imagine that there are a lot of emotions swirling around after three decades of advocacy and hard work we have entered into a crossroad where meaningful action is on the horizon. 
I would really like to get some sentiments from our panelists today before we kick off this celebration. It'd be really insightful to get your perspectives and know what this moment means to each of you. I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Charles Lee. Mr. Lee, what does this mo moment mean for you and any perspectives and sentiments that you want to share today? Thank you, uh, Dr. Upperman, and, uh, and thank you to the American Public Health Association for, um, uh, sp for sponsoring this uh, event. Um, in, the, in, uh, in the 1980s, I was the Director of Environmental Justice for the Commission for Racial Justice of the United Church of Christ, and uh, it was in that capacity that um, I became the lead organizer for the uh, first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. And um, so I guess I'm here to kind of set the stage for this conversation. Uh, and I would just say uh, to start off that uh, at that time, most people uh, did not think that uh, environmental issues were issues of concern to, um, to uh, people of color communities. And, uh, and um, having uh, worked uh, on this issue uh, for a number of years, I had realized by then that uh, that was uh, the furthest thing from the truth, that there was in fact a lot of um, work going on around environmental issues um, in uh, communities of color, uh, in um, indigenous communities, uh, in farm work communities, and, um, and, um, and, and uh, in a lot of ways, um, you know, that, is, that idea came about because most people uh, didn't see it as environmental issues because environmentalism um, as a movement, you know, saw itself uh, uh, focused on more conservation type issues, uh, all which are important, but, you know, they didn't really um, get to the um, issues of the uh, people that are uh, uh, suffering the most uh, from pollution, uh, the people that we now know are uh, disproportionately impacted uh, and, uh, and most vulnerable to pollution. And so uh, this is a call that a number of people um, put, uh, put forward to the, um, to the, um, uh, to the uh, heads of the, of the mainstream environmental organizations, um, uh, call, calling them to task about uh, their, their uh, issues of lack of diversity, but more important about how their policies uh, um, uh, impact communities of color negatively. So um, we saw this as a moment, not just to have a meeting uh, or a summit, but a, but a, um, but a moment in which uh, we can bring all the uh, communities of color together. Uh, and in that, uh, in that manner, um, um, make a statement. Uh, now about the fact that this uh, that communities of color have been are working on issues of, of the environment um, not for decades but perhaps for centuries, um, and that um, and that uh, bring the, bring all these people together uh, as we all found out you know created a whole new um, uh, momentum of its own, and um, and I think this is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we went to the summit um, uh, expecting, uh, I have put like 300 people or so as a, a, a marker for success, but over a thousand people came. Um, and we went there with just two goals. One of which is to, um, uh, one which is to codify a set of principles of environmental justice. And the other is a call, uh, call for action to go back to communities to, uh, to, um, uh, to organize, and um, and what really happened though was that we really did co coalesce in a national grassroots movement around environmental justice, and I think uh, the impact of that over thirty years was really uh, eloquently uh, spoken to by a uh, chair Mallory, uh, and I think all of us here today are going to speak to that. So I just end by saying uh, to kind of set the stage that. Um, when uh, I wrote in the proceedings of the uh, national, the first National People of Color Environmental uh, Leadership Summit, the introduction that begins with uh, on, on October 24th to 27th, 1991 in Washington, D.C., the environmental movement in the United States changed forever.
Thank you very much, Charles Lee. We'll like to pass the floor to Venice. Venice, any perspectives that you would like to share in this moment? Well, um, <laughs> it's hard to believe it's been 30 years. I can remember so many of those conversations. I can remember um, taking the train down with Peggy Shepard from New York. Um, I can remember walking into the, the ballroom after we checked in at the registration uh, desk for the conference, um, for the summit and walking into that room and seeing all those people and grabbing Peggy's hand and saying, oh my God, we're not by ourselves. And I don't know why, I've told that story so many times, I don't know why it makes me emotional every time I say it. Um, but it was a long slog for us in New York. And our mayor was giving us the blues, EPA was giving us the blues and discounting us. The New York City Department of Public Health was discounting us. New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, Department of Environmental Protection, everybody thought that we were not worth the time of day, that our lives did not matter. And we were fighting that by ourselves, just community members. None of us were environmentalists at the time. None of us had the expertise then that we have now. And when we rolled up at the summit and we saw those people, it was so gratifying just to be there in that space. So utterly, utterly gratifying. So that's one thing I wanna, I wanna share, Crystal, is I don't think people recognize that when you are in these fights, how isolating it can be. And when you are fighting an individual community or several communities together are fighting their own government, that just is not a position that anybody wants to be in. And we were fighting every branch of government. And then we were being told that we did not matter and that the concerns that we had were of no significance. So getting to the summit was a, a, a major thing. Being at the summit was an extraordinarily affirming activity. Coming out of the summit with the principles of environmental justice and the call to action and the, the charge to go back and organize in our communities and to still be standing is, a, is, is an exceptionally gratifying thing. But also on the journey, we've lost a lot of warriors, a lot of people who died before their time. And so I just want folks to know that while it is wonderful to have Chair Mallory open this conversation and it is wonderful to have our president, President Biden, be so receptive to our work. Do not think for one moment that a whole lot of payment has been made in blood and tears and vibrancy and wholeness. People gave up a lot to get to this moment, an awful lot. And some folks didn't make it. So we are gratified about where we are, um, but my God, was it a long, hard journey to get here. Wow, heartfelt. And thank you so much for that, Vernice. Dr. Linda Marie Murray, how, how, how are your thoughts today, present moment, reflecting on, on the journey that you all have taken? Well, good evening, everyone who's joining us. Let me just say that I certainly agree with the previous two speakers. This summit crystallized a process that is important if we're going to go forward. Just as it's not simply that many people in the quote environmental movement thought people of color didn't understand the environment. It's that we led ourselves to believe that these arenas of struggle, that because you're worried about diesel in New York City or because you're worried about uh, toxins in Love Canal, or because you're worried about the inability to vote in uh, Mississippi, that these are somehow separate struggles. So I think that that uh, Charles's insight 
in calling uh, and organizing this conference was exactly that. And if you read the principles, it brings together the traditional, what we call the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement, with the traditional environmental movement focused on toxic hazards and air pollution, with uh, indigenous people's uh, treaty violations, with an anti-war sentiment there, with workers' rights and, and workers' justice. So when you read the principles, what, what happened in, at this summit is people of color came together and said, we are suffering from the same cause. And the fact that some of us have pain in our arm and others of us have pain in the foot, it's the same body, the same earth, the same peoples. And I think that's really the question going forward. So I think the, the summit helped reframe the discussion around environment. I think that we are talking more today when we talk about the climate crisis in that vein. And I think the critical thing is not simply that we're now recognized that this is an issue. You'd have to be an idiot not to see that this is a major problem and that these environmental crises are going to hit poor people and people of color the hardest. The real question is what we're going to do about that. And while I am pleased that we have improvement in Washington, as opposed to the previous four years, uh, it's not enough. The question is not, are we better than we were four years ago? The question is, what do we need to do to make sure that our children and our children's children can survive? And in that area, I feel that we are failing. We are not doing enough. And it means the same kind of energy that existed in that first summit has to come forward again and link all of our struggles together, because that's the only way we're going to make progress. Wow, Dr. Murray, definitely legacy building is very important and I appreciate that sentiment for sure. Next, we'll pass the floor to Ms. Leslie Fields. Good evening. Um, I am very, very happy and very honored to be here tonight with um, all of you. Thank you all. The advocacy um, and legal experts here. Um, thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here and thank you all for joining us. And I just really, um, so much of what has transpired, as Renice and Charles mentioned, and Dr. Murray, because of the people who've gone before us and who've been active for a very long time. And I see the summit as this huge seeding of a movement. It was a storm that just came about and then seeded so many active and connected so many people. I was not at the summit. I had heard, I was hearing about the summit. I had just moved, um, I just drove a U-Haul from DC to Austin, Texas for three days and started a new job uh, in Austin, Texas. And I could not get back for the summit, but I was here, I had hearing about it. I had read Toxic Waste and Race and I was very inspired by the summit and the people who came back from the summit. And um, I got to work in Austin as I was volunteering and running around with the Texas NAACP and the Lone Star chapter of the Sierra Club. I had the great privilege of meeting and learning and working with um, Susanna Almanza and Silvia Herrera of Poder who were struggling and fighting um, against Tank Farm and the Holly Power Plant. And that's where I cut my teeth and also issues in West Texas and all around Texas was looking for on the weekends, we were sent out by the, the chapter director, state conference director of the NAACP, Gary Bledsoe, who is still the state conference director. And so that involvement changed my life. It's become a calling, but I see the summit as seeding us. And even if we all weren't there, that we were so inspired by it. And when people came back from it, you all had the connections to make those connections so that the rest of us who weren't able to go were able to easily meet people, easily start working with people and find out when the next movement, the next conference was, the next activity was. And so the summit was a just milestone and actually a historic event that um, really made such a difference in the lives of so many people, um, I think, and also inspired people globally. So. I, um, we are indebted um, to all of you all who put that work in, who slept on the floor, who made their way when there was no way all this time. And um, so it's just great to be able to reflect on those days. And um, thank you all so much for everything that you've been doing. Wow, thank you all for those poignant sentiments. So 30 years ago at the 1991 summit, 
Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton gave remarks. Here is a trip down memory lane. Brothers and sisters, it's been my great fortune to be involved in great movements in this country, in the movement for racial justice, in the movement for ethnic justice, in the movement for justice for women, in the movement for economic justice, as a civil liberties union, in the movement for criminal justice. And now we see here the final leg of the movement for environmental justice. This conference says clearer and louder than anything I could imagine that all these issues are our issues and that especially environmental justice is our issue. That is what this conference is gonna say to the Congress which sits here where you sit today, that our bills have come due. Our bills are overdue. Our bills have been the last to be submitted and we submit them now for immediate payment. The environment belongs to all of God's children. You assert that this evening. America will one day hear you. This I promise you. This one member of Congress means to make sure that the Congress of the United States hears your call. We know we have inherited this earth in this generation and we mean to take our inheritance now. Thank you for coming to Washington. Wow. This, I mean, every time I hear it, bills come due, are overdue, and have been the last to be submitted. I, I mean, I, I want to get from the panelists, what parts of Congresswoman Norton's sentiments, you know, 30 years ago resonated most with you then, and still moves you today because that's just poignant. Mr. Charles Lee? So when um, I hear those words um, and, um, you know, I, uh, especially now I'm reminded of, um, or I think about uh, I, environmental justice um, in a way that Dr. King had talked about the arc of the Moran universe um, being, um, being long, uh, but it bends towards justice. And, um, you know, I truly believe that environmental justice now has its own arc of history. And that, um, and that um, you know, the, what the summit did um, was to plant the seeds like that, you know, in, in terms of how we think about what we're, uh, what uh, this movement is all about. Uh, even at that point, you know, and for many years after that, um, I would say that environmental justice was just a um, uh, uh, something that communities talk about and a few activists, you know, that it wasn't in the American mainstream consciousness, you know, and uh, it took, um, you know, many things, a lot of organizing on the ground that brought issues um, to the table and really started to make change. Uh, but on a national level, and we'll know, um, you know, it was um, events like Katrina and Flint, Michigan, that kind of really started to get this into the uh, the, the nation's political discourse. And, um, but it wasn't, um, you know, but this didn't just come about, uh, you know, uh, accidentally. It was a lot of conscious organizing uh, on the ground. It was a lot of very um, uh, detailed work on the part of, uh, of uh, many people, uh, and this is many people, not only in communities, but in academic institutions and in government um, that push an agenda forward. Um, and, you know, we're so lucky. I'm, I feel myself to be so lucky to be at the point where you can see uh, it come to fruition. Uh, not that the work is done, but we, but, you know, the summit reached another milestone 
with, uh, with um, the way that environmental justice is now seen at the very center of the nation's policy agenda. Great. Uh, I, wow. And, you know, Bernice, what, what is your take on that? Reflecting on Congresswoman Norton's words and sentiments, the movement away from being seen as a grassroots now being elevated and being sort of accepted and also being amplified, being recognized. You, you had a lot of emotion early on expressing, feeling like you were alone, feeling like David against Goliath. But here we are today. What part of Congresswoman Norton's sentiments um, still move you today? You're on mute. The check is still out there and the payment is still due. Um, but I, I loved the continuity of how she saw us looking at us, you know, in that, in that ballroom at the Washington Court Hotel. You could tell that she saw us as part of the legacy that she herself was a part of, right? A member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a member of the planning committee that planned the March on Washington the last person to leave the organizing for the March on Washington um, from New York coming, flying down to DC. Um, the person who is, you know, is the touchstone of these social movements and still in the fight. We think of ourselves as derived from that movement that she was a part of, that took her to Congress. And we are still, still in a fight. We've made a lot of progress. We've made a lot of progress and nobody can deny that. Brenda is a part of that progress. Charles is a part of that progress. Mustafa Ali, who, who was at EPA for 25 years. Um, the Office of Environmental Justice is a part of that progress. Who could have imagined that? At that moment when she was saying those things to us that we are part of a continuum and the continuum continues to flow. But just to be clear, the check is still due, right? Although this time there seem to be more funds in the account than there have ever been before. Um, and more people who are paying attention to how do we serve the needs of these communities that have been so left out. I, and lastly, we just have to say, she was in a conversation then, and we're still in a conversation now, about the need for statehood for the District of Columbia so that she can be a voting member of the Congress of these United States. That is a part of the environmental justice conversation, right? All these people left out, not able to make their own decisions about what happens in their city. But we still have made so much progress. And I, I just don't want anybody to, to not understand we have come a mighty 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 long way and i you know i look at brenda sitting in that beautiful office um i look at the vice president sitting in her office and i think about president obama and i think about all the people who organized in these communities for justice but who also turned out people to vote who also ran for office who also sat around those decision-making tables so that we could be here at this moment, right? It is not magic, it's hard work. That's how we got here. And that's what she told us that day. Hard work is gonna put us in a place where we need to be. Wow, and that shows the case. Dr. Murray. Well, at the time uh, that she gave this address, I certainly was moved by the fact that she linked all of these movements together with what we were there for environmental justice. I think the participants, the thousand participants of this summit understood profoundly that link. Um, and uh, I, I want to be clear about this though. The challenges we face have increased. So just in case anyone doubts why we are facing coronavirus today, it is because of the profound negative impact of human beings on the climate. Uh, this will not, it's not the first pandemic, and unfortunately, it's not going to be the last pandemic, but, but these outbreaks are very much linked 
to environmental injustice. And even today, as we fight this virus, we have people in Africa and India unable and Latin America unable to get vaccines. It's the same injustice. And to the extent that we connect those thoughts, understand that and ask ourselves again, not are we doing better than yesterday? That's good that we are, but are we doing what needs to be done to solve the problems? Thank you, Leslie. Your thoughts on Doc, uh, Congresswoman Norton's sentiments 30 years ago? Oh, well, um, Congresswoman Norton is my Congresswoman. And so I always sit up, stand up, straighten up when she comes around. She's also my labor law professor and was a tough, tough professor. And so um, as Bernice mentioned, she, she is still in the fight. She is still fighting for us in the District of Columbia. Um, she can vote in committee, but she can't vote on the floor but she wields a great deal of influence and she still is a fighting for environmental justice here in the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia has a lot of issues and has had a lot of uh, pollution issues and EJ issues in the past. And so we are very proud of her. And I think what, when I think of her, she has um, always been about intersectionality. She has always brought race and gender and class and workers' rights into every, um, every part of her um, work. And so, you know, the, the, the long, her long great civil rights history that Vernice briefly recounted um, is always present. And she makes sure that we understand that we have to do the same. And so I think of her, I think when I see that clip, it just, um, it's just so great that she's still our delegate and, um, you know, that the arc is still moving and we, and I agree with Charles that it's a separate, you know, we have our own arc now. And um, I'm just very glad that um, we have some accomplishments here in the District of Columbia, but yes, just like with uh, Puerto Rico and the um, other territories, we do not have voting rights. We have taxation without representation. And so it's um, a travesty and um, we keep fighting on that and is part of the justice, the justice agenda. Wow, so I have a, uh, a question that I'll put out there for any of the panelists who want to answer it. So this question is in, in terms of, since we're talking about bills being paved. So someone wants to know, how do we ensure that bills are paid as we build back better? For instance, the situation with water in Michigan and sewage in the South has gone on for a really, really long time. How do we make sure work is done and not wasted on ineffective city managers and consultants? So I, th I think the critical thing with all of these things that, that the summit showed, if you listen carefully to all the participants, you have that power, first of all, uh, not just the power to vote, and we're about to lose that. We clearly need to secure that that right and protect it and expand it. But you have to have real power on the ground that we organize uh, uh, at, at, in terms of making sure that those local policies are are changed and that the money is spent better. But the, but let me be clear. Um, you know when you're when you're poor and you're not getting any attention, a dime seems like when I was a child, if someone gave me a, a penny, I thought I was in heaven. But a penny is not going to buy anything when I was a child. It certainly buys less now. So we have not yet invested, from what I can tell from the evening news, enough money to even do the Build Back Better agenda appropriately. And of course, that is just the first step. That's not what we need. So to answer the question in a direct way, nothing guarantees us unless we're out there in the voting booths, in the streets, in the office parlors, in Congress. We have to be everywhere fighting for frankly, the principles that came out uh, in that summit, the environmental justice principles, if we were able to fight for all 17 of these principles, we would be going a long way into solving the problems. Thank yeah, you, Dr. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the money that the funding that is going to come down from the federal government is going to the states. And so people, everybody listening, everybody on this call, everybody needs to make sure and commit to making sure that their communities receive that. It's just taxpayer dollars. These are taxpayers. You all are taxpayers and this is your funding and you have to make sure on your local level and state level, they go to certain, certain agencies run by maybe some governors who you didn't vote for. You have to make sure that that funding gets to the, your community and gets to where it needs to be and not be sent somewhere else 
um, or not directed toward the, the most um, in places that have the most vulnerabilities? Crystal, I think it's also important um, in this moment when people wanna be ahistorical and act like nothing came before this and that nothing has happened that was fundamentally based on racial discrimination that created these inequities, we have to first teach people the history, even the people who don't wanna learn, but especially as Leslie just said, the people who are in positions of authority and influence over public funding and public expenditures, because we've been spending money and making decisions for millennia, but certainly for the last 100 years that was baked and steeped in systemic racism. Who gets access to water systems? And who does not in the same municipality, in the same city, in the same in the same zip code, right? Who gets the landfills? Who gets transportation corridors and highways that dissect their communities? Who gets green space? That's all publicly funded. And now, when we think about modernizing and revolutionizing and greening a lot of these antiquated systems. The first thing we have to do is remove the fundamental racism out of that decision-making process. So I know that there's conversation going on about this and I know there's thought going on about this, but before we start doing any shovel-ready funding and investing, let's make sure that the shovels are not shoveling the stuff that we've been living with for decades, more of that, right? And, and you hear Secretary, DOT Secretary Buttigieg talk about this a lot in terms of the history of transportation inequity and the history of racism in that system. Well, you first have to acknowledge that and you have to extricate that from the decision-making processes. So, because otherwise we're just gonna continue to replicate the processes and the practices that we've had that put us in this situation in the first place. So we need to teach some history. We need to teach local land use planners some history. We, used to, we need to teach local jurisdictions and we need to teach federal agencies and federal decision makers. And let me just lift up the Army Corps um, as an entity that needs to do some serious learning, some serious learning about how to do decision making in a way that doesn't adversely impact our lives for generations hence, right? Um, there's a lot of learning that needs to happen. And a lot of it is at the governmental decision making levels, but we are the ones with the information and we are the ones that need to do the teaching at every level before any of these expenditures get made. Um, I, I just, you know, in Maryland, we are having a conversation about expanding the beltway. That may not mean anything for you all who don't live in the District of Columbia or in the DC Metro region or the DMV, as we like to say. But the reason that Prince George's County, the most affluent majority African-American county in the nation is also the COVID epicenter in the state of Maryland, is because we are ringed by highways, ringed, and our governor wants to build more. And that's what they're gonna use that funding for unless we intersect in that process and that decision-making. We cannot do what we used to do because what we used to do has been killing us. So we need new imagination, we need new thinking, we need new resources. And I think we have some incredibly talented and gifted people in this administration. But as Leslie said, I don't know what y'all gonna do with these states. But we got to get on it because that's where the rubber is going to hit the road. So before we start shoveling all kinds of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars into their coffers, let us make sure that they are not replicating the exclusionary and racist decision making practices that they've done heretofore that put us in the situation that we're in now. Wow. Oh, thanks, Bernice. Mr. Lee, did you want to answer that question or? Well, I don't know how much more I can say. Uh, everybody said a lot of what I was going to say. I, I, I just think that one other thing that um, I want to uh, go back to, and I think everybody uh, everybody kind of spoke to this, as Chair Mallory talked about uh, the uh, all government, the whole government approach, and that, you know, we have to understand that it's going to take a lot of different um, um, agencies, a lot of different programs, a lot of different, um, uh, at, at all different levels of government working together. Um, and it has to be done in a way that's really authentic in terms of 
um, uh, solutions that are really community driven. Uh, and that means, um, you know, what Vernice talked about in terms of really understanding the history of these, um, of, of, of these communities and how systemic racism is an integral part of that. Uh, we now know that, um, that um, you know, uh, the, um, there is a link between um, policies like redlining and current environmental conditions. We, we know that, um, you know, this is something that um, um, is um, that you can see on a map, you know, when you start to overlay um, um, uh, redlining maps with uh, uh, EJ screening maps and uh, you can see the, uh, the correlation really clearly. You can see uh, the, the studies around where urban heat islands are. Uh, and you know, and and these red line maps, and you can go on down the on, on down the line in terms of that. So I think um, I totally agree. You got to look at um, the, the 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 policies that drove on uh, um, these uh, conditions, the, the practices that led to these conditions. And if we can't name it, uh, we're not going to be able to address them. Wow! Great! Great! Wow! Awesome! So now we have some present day remarks from Congresswoman Holmes Norton. And after that, we'll be followed by some historical remarks from Bernice 30 years ago, discussing the efforts behind the 17 principles of environmental justice, which we were, which were promulgated in, at the summit 30 years ago. I'm honored to speak to you today on the 30th anniversary of the National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. My thanks to the American Public Health Association and the United Church of Christ for jointly hosting this momentous event. With the widespread climate and environmental problems that we face today, environmental justice is more important than ever. In 1991, over 300 people of color gathered together in Washington, D.C. to address this issue Many of the principles of environmental justice they agreed to were remain true today. Combating climate change has long been one of my top priorities in Congress. I have supported many bills aimed at protecting our environment, including the Great American Outdoors Act, which became law last year and provides funding for the National Park Service to address deferred maintenance at our many federal parks here in the district. Environmental justice demands that public policy be based on mutual respect and justice for all people, free from any form of discrimination or bias. This can only be achieved when those policies are transparent. Last Congress, I joined the House Committee on Oversight and Reform's Subcommittee on the Environment, which allowed me to expand on my role of holding the federal government accountable for all its decisions that may impact the environment. Congratulations on 30 years of holding the National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. I look forward to future summits where people of color can continue to provide their unique perspective on environmental and climate issues essential to achieving environmental justice. Thank you. to define in our language through our minds what we did. And that's what we tried to do. We tried to represent your interests. We tried to represent the things that you had to say. And I, I hope that we did justice to that. There, there was equal participation among all of us um, in gender, in cultural, ethnic background, and in age. And I think that really speaks to the movement that we're trying to create. And I think that that's really important that we didn't have to struggle to achieve it. Wow. Bernice, what does it feel like seeing yourself, those words, the sentiments? I know you said early on, you know, 
you were very emotional that day, holding Peggy Shepard's hand, reflecting and seeing how, what are your, what, what are your thoughts? Mute. So one thing is I wish my hair still looked like that and I still own that dress though. I don't know why. Um, uh, I remember that night. Um, and I think I want to say that was that Saturday night. So we ended the conference on Sunday, um, October 27th. So this was Saturday, October 26th. And we had been, um, we had been debating and debating and debating and going back and forth. And there were so many drafts and so many discussions about every dot and tittle. Um, and then by the time we got to Saturday night, we just wanted people to, you know, okay, this is the last go round. But no, they wanted to talk and talk and talk. And I think we actually were, were debating until midnight um, what was going on. But when I look at Mia, um, she was either 19 or 20 at the time. And she was a student organizer from the University of Illinois at Urbana, I think. Um, and she and I were, she was in the audience at a panel of women um, leaders from the summit that happened on Tuesday night. And Mia dropped in the chat that she did not have a hotel room. I did not know that. Um, I'm telling you, people came from everywhere to be in that space. And she's right. We were, it, it was a completely democratic exercise. Um, and it was, an, it was an amazing, amazing thing. Now she is the executive director of the Asian Pacific Environmental Network. And she is a force to be reckoned with. And I just think about, you know, all the people who were in that room, all the energy, all the commitment, what people did after they left that process. Um, it is one of the, it is absolutely one of the most important things that I've ever had the opportunity to be a part of. It has shaped my life. It has shaped my career. It has shaped my worldview about the need for democratic decision-making, the need for creating a table that all kinds of people can find their way to and gather. And if you find, we say this a lot in the EJ movement, if you are in a room about whatever the environmental conversation is, whatever the policy conversation is, and there are no women in that room, you need to say something and do something. If you are in a room and there are no people of color in that room, you need to stop that conversation and say that there's some people who need to be in this space with us. If there are no young people in that room, you need to say the same things. If there are no people who are differently abled, you need to stop that conversation until we can get them to the table and in the room, not just in the room around the sides watching, but at the table where the decision making is happening. And that has been a value, Crystal, that I have taken through all of my work these 30 years because of being in that room at that time through that process. It's the most liberating thing I've ever been a part of, but it shows you that democratic decision-making really does work and it really is the way to go. Um, and we continue to try to teach people that, but you know, we should not be at a point 30 years hence where we having conversations about things that impact people's lives out into the future or you know, just 30 days hence, where everybody is not in the room. And if you mm -hmm. find yourself in those conversations where the people you know who should be are not there, then it's your obligation to stop that conversation, put a pin in that conversation and say, let me go and get some other folk um, who need to be in this table, who can help inform it, who can help shape it, who can bring some different thinking, but we can't, we can't depend on those old ways of, of making decisions. And again, you know, I just, I, I, I don't want to embarrass Brenda, but Brenda's at the head of the table, right? And to me, I could not have imagined that 30 years ago, but, <laughs> but there she is, right? Wow. So we now have another clip with a familiar face. There are things we have in common, and there are some important differences, and those differences need to be raised up and respected. My understanding of this point 
is recognizing, let me try to put this in, in crude language, recognizing that the government of the United States has broken treaties with certain Native American peoples. Okay, in this in this land. Then there are groups of people with indigenous people, native people, with whom they have no treaty relationships, that they've never had. A, and what and I think, and I, I would include hope Hawaiians in that, as well as some people on the continental United States with whom the government has never had a treaty, but ought, but ought to have some. Dr. Murray, you were speaking up for our Native American brothers and sisters. I don't think I was so much speaking up for them. They were very capable of speaking for themselves. I was just trying to do something that we've talked about here tonight, understand some history. So the, the wealth of this country, and in fact, the great W.E.D. Du Bois argued in Black Reconstruction, the wealth of Europe, of the Western world, is based on the stealing of land in, in this hemisphere from our indigenous people and especially in North America and, and South America, I shouldn't exclude it, on the slave labor of slaves brought predominantly from Africa, but also from Asia. So we should be clear about the history. So we created this wealth and the primary source of that first part of the wealth, the stealing of the land, is something that has to be acknowledged and recognized. Um, and so we are not just talking about one community here, one community there. We need to be understanding how did we fundamentally end up in this mess? We put the lives of people below making money. And until we change that, until we understand that we need to put people's health first, we're not going to make progress. And when we talk about funds to pay the bills, we need to start taxing corporations and million and billionaires so that they because none of those things happen without them using Lake Michigan to fuel their steel plants or taking the land and forests to, to make their profits. So these are things that we hold in common as human beings. And we have to insist that people who are accountable for soiling our planet begin to pay for that desecration that they've engaged in. Wow, Leslie, your take on reflecting on Dr. Murray's words 30 years ago. Well, I just think that, um, you know, it was very powerful and it showed a great deal, you know, just that clip of the kind of allyship and solidarity that um, I know permeated the conference. And again, influenced the rest of us in co subsequent conferences. And so no matter where you went after that conference or who you were involved in, that's the kind of um, posture and you, know, you had to come, you had to come with it. You had to know the history. You had to be responsible and understand the intersectionality of this work. And it's very important. Um, and so, and you have to also be there in terms of the people speak for themselves. And that really is the, the prime directive um, and so, but you can be an ally, you can be a co-conspirator, you can be um, in solidarity with other movements. And it's really necessary um, for the, you know, for to achieve, to get some accomplishments and to achieve the solutions that come, the best solutions come from the people closest to the issues. Wow, Charles. The best solutions come from the people closest to the problem. How have you employed that? Well, you know, um, I, I want to go back to um, the, 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 a couple of the, or one of the biggest um, themes of the summit in terms of how we went about organizing it and how, how, we, um, how uh, we, we conducted it uh, was the idea of we speak for ourselves. That people, you know, um, that the communities, um, you know, were not going to let uh, other people kind of represent them, but that they were going to be there to speak for themselves, and that, um, and um, and in fact, you know, um, we see how all that coming together uh, produced uh, the kind of results that we did, and I really believe. Uh, and uh, I really agree with uh, what Vernie said about, you know, this is like. Uh, democracy at work at its best. 
I also um, wanted to say uh, one other reflection about all this, which, um, you know, when I look at back at the summit um, and I, uh, and and you know things that were uh, I thought were um, could have been done better was um, you know there were not that many Asian American Pacific Islanders there. There were some powerful voices like Miliani Trask from um, Hawaii or Dr. Jetan Anjan from the Marshall Islands, uh, but um, there weren't a whole lot of Asian Americans, you know and. Um, I was going to mention how um, um, uh, Mia, uh, uh, talk about Mia and how she was a student intern. She went to the summit and she told me that how that kind of changed her, her, um, her life. And, you know, it, uh, it kind of set the course for what kind of uh, work she, she wanted to do. And, you know, and, um, you know, now she's, um, uh, now um, she's, uh, you know, not only was the director of the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, but, you know, a member of the White House Council on, of um, on Environmental Justice, but then actually is now a real um, uh, movement uh, uh, organizing in the Asian American communities around environmental justice. And that's, um, you know, that's really, um, has come a long way. So I think that, you know, I was really gratified by how the summit kind of laid the seeds for that. A couple of years ago, um, somebody who was a graduate student uh, wanted to do her PhD thesis on how the Asian American environmental justice movement started with the summit. So, and that I really um, thought was really, uh, uh, really meant a lot to me. And Vernice as you take yourself off mute, reflecting on Dr. Murray's remarks and what the rest of the panelists have shared, what are, what are your takeaways? What are your thoughts? How do you feel about you know, folks having the ability and access to platforms to be able to speak for themselves? How has that contributed to the overall movement and how much of that needs to continue into the future? It definitely needs to continue into the future. If I remember correctly, um, Dr. Murray, she was raising these issues from her perch as a physician and an administrator at Cook County General Hospital. And she kept raising the intersection of environment and poverty and racism and adverse health outcomes long before we were talking about health inequities and the conversation that is so germane in APHA and across APHA and public health circles now, but she was in many ways a lone voice and she took a lot of hits for taking the stance that she did and fighting for her patients and fighting for her communities. And a lot of EJ leaders were out there lone voices by themselves. And so the thing I would say is that we need not let the folks who are, who are carrying the conversation be out there by themselves when we know that they're doing battle on behalf of all of us. We need to lift each other up. And as she said, I have, you know, I have just never forgotten the, the interactions we had with indigenous folks and other folks from all over the country and continue to raise my voice on their behalf. And that's what I, what I, I saw her do at the summit. Um, and I think it's our obligation to not only speak for ourselves or, or where we stand or where we live, but for all the people we're in this, in this effort with. Um, that is true for me from Mililani. And, and, and I, and I want to say I took that, that practice um, with me to the Ford Foundation and lifted up as many people as I could and brought as many people together and then into these global conversations. That was taught to me by Dr. Jean Sindab and Dana Austin at the summit. There was a whole section on the summit on sustainable development, which was that global conversation. And they made sure that they dragged us into that conversation because we didn't want to go, but they dragged us there. And it is reflected right now in the EJ voices that are in the COP process. So, we have to lift each other up. It, there's no singular pursuit in environmental justice. It is always a collective pursuit. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Linda Ray. 
for reminding us. Wow. So in the words of celebration, this is a celebration. I wanna provide each of the panelists 30 seconds to give us some celebratory reflections. A lot of emotion here in terms of what we've gone through, but in the moment of celebration, what would you pass on as a baton to the next generation? And I'll go to Mr. Lee, Charles Lee. Uh, we have come a long way, you know, there's no doubt about it, but, you know, uh, as everyone says, we got a lot, we got a lot more work to do and um, the challenges are not, um, are even greater today than they were before. So um, we need to learn from uh, the, the experiences of the summit, the voices, the wisdom of the people that um, participated and, um, and then, and, and go to work. Go to work, Leslie. Well, I've been blessed. Uh, this has been a calling for me. Um, it's taken me all over the world and I get to meet the best people. And I'm here tonight with so many of them. And some of them are become very good friends. Uh, and, um, you know, the if you are protecting your environment, you're also protecting your cultural environment. You're protecting your culture. You're protecting your culture. Then it is a celebratory. It is, um, you know, it is a lot of joy. Uh, this much of this work is joyous work because you are protecting all those the foods and the and the and the the part you know the the celebrations the festivals all of these things that are surrounded in community so that is a part of the, um, our work and that um, it's very important that that um, we take you take care of yourself in this work and that you keep celebrating. I'm really appreciating you ending this, even with the folks who are have passed on. The other thing that I was reminded of when um, um, Congresswoman Norton spoke was that she also gave the eulogy for our friend Damu Smith. And that was a celebration of life when he passed away. And so that uh, I was reminded of that. And again, we it's a circle that um, we have to keep reminding ourselves of. and that you know that you can build into this work and make it joyous and make it your you know there's so many aspects to it there's so many ways to go about it it's mm -hmm. incredibly interesting and rewarding but it is very unfair and the burdens that are on the communities that are disproportionately put on those communities so um that is that we still have a lot to do and i know i um, thank everyone who's watching and all the others out there who've been involved in this struggle um, to make, the, make that way that has been the way. So thank you. And then we'll go to Vernice and then Dr. Murray. I was just on another conversation hosted by the Anacostia Community Museum right before this. Um, and somebody asked a similar question. And my answer was to remember to, to celebrate to celebrate the culture, whatever the culture is. Um, one thing I remember about Damu, um, he always, wherever we were, whatever gathering we were in, we always took time to have a party. I mean, a real party with a DJ um, and real dancing. Party for a he, purpose. Party for a purpose. And he gave some of the best parties ever been thrown in the District of Columbia and in other parts of the world, I might add. Um, but the work is serious, but it should not be so serious that we forget to celebrate how far we've come, that we're still standing, that you know, there's, there's good music, there's good written word, there's good spoken word, there's good, there's just good culture. And cultural celebration has gotta be a part of this movement. And I feel like we have somehow stepped away from that and we need to get back to that. Um, it, is, it is not just drudgery, right? It is a celebration of life is why we do this work and a celebration of the planet and a celebration of all the, the incredible gifts that we've been given. So it, you know, it's time, it's always time 
to celebrate. So when we gather, right, it can't just be about meetings. It should be about sharing meals together whenever we have the opportunity to be able to be safely in each other's space again, to do cultural things, to bring young people into the space and let them show us what, you know, what is happening. Um, we, we just have to take more time, I think, to just lift ourselves up. Um, it can't just be about the difficult, difficult work. Sometimes it's gotta be about just standing back and looking how far we have come. Um, every night during the summit, we had a cultural celebration that Damu was in charge of, as I recall. Um, and he brought all kinds of people into that space to celebrate with us. So I just wanna remind us that um, cultural uplift is also a part of movement building. Dr. Murray. Well, I think that, that Bernice remembers, right? That the summit opened with uh, drumming from our indigenous nations. Uh, we certainly uh, uh, celebrated throughout the summit. We are peoples that some folks have tried to crush and destroy, but we're still here and we're still fighting. And, and because our ancestors were really seeds of who we are today and the environmental justice summit of 30 years ago, as Charles has so eloquently said, has been the seeds for what's going on now and what will go on in the future. So there's no reason to despair. Uh, we know where we come from and we know where we're going. And as long as we do it together, we will make progress. Wow, what a what a rousing conversation. Um, I would I would like to take this moment to thank each and every one of you on the panel today. Um, Mr. Charles Lee, Senior Policy Advisor at the EPA's Office of Environmental Justice, Dr. Linda Ray Murray, the past president of the American Public Health Association. Mrs. Leslie Fields, National Director in Policy, Advocacy and Legal at the Sierra Club. And last but not least, Mrs. Renice Miller-Travis, Executive Vice President at the Metropolitan Group. Thank each of you for a very thought-provoking and open conversation today. Moreover, I would like to thank each of you for your leadership in the environmental justice and climate justice movement, um, Ashe. We are now going to transition to the next piece of our agenda in remembrance of those in the movement who we've lost along the way. After the remembrance, our final clip of the evening will be a segment of a speech that Dana Alston gave in, at the 1991 summit. And after the clip of Dana Alston, we'll be joined once again by Reverend Brooks Brandt and this year's APHA Damu Smith Award winners Mr. Omega Wilson and Mrs. Brenda Wilson, who are longtime environmental justice champions in North Carolina. Bernice, you know, knew Dana really well. Um, and it's my understanding that you saw Dana right before she took the stage in this next clip we're about to queue up. Could you please do us the honor of introducing the clip we're about to watch together? Well, on Thank you, Crystal. On Tuesday, I learned from Gail Small, the founding executive director of Native Action and a member of the Cheyenne Nation, um, that she and Dana were roommates. And they were up all night as Dana was working on drafts of this, um, of this uh, speech. I happened to be in possession of a lot of Dana's papers. Um, and I have one of her handwritten copies of the beginning of the speech, which will be donated to the Anacostia Community Museum. Um, the next day, right before she was going to give the speech, we, we, it, was a, it was a session right after the luncheon. And it was a, a presentation from Dana. And then there was supposed to be a response from uh, may, mainstream environmental leaders. And I think it was um, Fisher from the Sierra Club and John Adams, the founding executive director of the Natural Resources Defense Council. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're all coming back from lunch and, you know, there's hundreds of people moving back and forth in the hallways, but Dana finds a group of us, well, it's actually a group of us from New York, Peggy Shepard, Jean Sindab, um, Jeribu Hill, Myself, I think Angela Dews, who's a founding member of WEAC for Environmental Justice, and a few other people. 
and she stopped us in this sea of people going back and forth trying to get from the luncheon to back to our seats. And Dana says, I need you to pray with me. And she was a very close personal friend of mine. And I'm like, she had never asked me to pray for her before over for any reason. Why now and why in the midst of this? And she didn't tell us. She just said, I have to give this speech and I just need some prayer to cover me so that I can say what needs to be said. And so Jean, who was uh, formerly of the World Council of Churches, at that point, Jean was the director of Eco Justice for the National Council of Churches. Jean led the prayer and we held hands and we encircled her and we prayed and we put hands on her. And then she said, okay, I think I, think I got it. And then she disappeared. And then the next thing, you know, she was introduced and she gave this talk. Now, the other thing I would say about the talk is um, the drafting committee working on the principles of environmental justice were not in the physical room when Dana spoke. We were in an ante room, door closed. They're all, you know, like hundreds of feet away. And we heard screaming and shouting and stomping and clapping. It was like a revival. It was like a, you know, a, a Pentecostal tent revival. We didn't know what was going on. And then we came to find out later on, it was Dana giving that speech and people exhorting their receptivity about what she was saying because she went straight to the heart of the matter. But she said things that people were holding deep that they hadn't been able to say. And Dana said it out loud. And she paid a heavy price for the things that she said, she needed that prayer, but she went in and, and did it anyway. So I, I cannot wait to, to hear it. We have come here to define for ourselves the issues of the ecology and the environment. To speak these truths that we know from our lives, to those participants and observers who have we have invited here to join us. We have come for you to hear from our mouths directly our understandings so there will be no confusion and no misunderstandings. For us, the issues of the environment do not stand alone by themselves. They are not narrowly defined. Our vision of the environment is woven into an overall framework of social, racial, and economic justice. It is deeply rooted in our cultures and our spirituality. It is based in a long tradition and understanding and respect for the natural world. The environment for us is where we live, where we work, and where we play. The environment affords us the platform to address the critical issues of our time. Questions of militarism and defense policy. <laughs> religious freedom, cultural survival, energy, sustainable development, the future of our cities, transportation, housing, land and sovereignty rights, self-determination, employment, and we can go on and on. What we seek is a relationship based on equity, mutual respect, mutual interest and justice. We refuse narrow definitions. It's not just ancient forests. That's important. It's just not saving the whales. That's, in, in, that's important. And saving other endangered species, that's important. We understand the life cycle and the connectedness of life. But our communities and our people are endangered species too. <laughs> we 
We refuse a paternalistic relationship. interested in a parent-child relationship. Your organizations may be or may not be older than ours. Your organizations definitely have more money than I <laughs> But if we are to form, if you are to form a partnership with us, it will be as equals and nothing else but equals. With those powerful words that continue to resonate and reverberate to today, we transition to this time of remembrance. I want to begin with a personal word of thanks to uh, Brenda and Omega Wilson. When the planning committee was putting together the program for tonight and putting together the 30th anniversary website, uh, they said that we needed to have space dedicated for remembrance. That was wise and insightful for them to, to put that forward. And, and when we were receiving written reflections from people, um, from different, different authors, different places, it was again powerful to, to read about the profound impact that those who have been pioneers and leaders in the environmental justice movement have had. It was humbling and inspiring, and I invite everybody to, to read those reflections that one can find on the 30th anniversary celebration website. Each of the persons was a gift to us, to the movement, and to the world. If I might draw from the Christian vernacular, they were saints. They were bearers of light, and their lives have lit the path before us. We are strengthened by our remembrance of them and we honor them by caring for the spirit of justice that they so ably embodied. I will turn things now over to Brenda and Omega Wilson. Thank you very much. Uh, we are pleased to be here for three reasons tonight. We are the first couple to receive the Damu Smith Award as co-founders of the West End Revitalization Association here in Mebbin, North Carolina. This is a high honor coming from the environmental section of the American Public Health Association and our environmental justice friends and family. The organizers and participants for the first National People of Color Environmental Justice Leadership Summit were diverse by age, by gender, by ethnic background and by geographical footprint. They came together to seek avenues and policies to reduce the pain, suffering, and death of their families and friends. Some of them we know by face, others we know by name. Many of those who spoke, spoke with inspired and passionate voices 30 years ago and are now in God's grace and resting in peace. Their names are Damu Smith, Dana Austin, Hazel Johnson, Jean Gunna, Andrea Kidd Taylor, Wilma Mankiller, Gwendolyn Patton, Connie Tucker, Sigman Rye, and Jean Sindak. We are also here to pay tribute to all of those unnamed and unknown who may have not left a national footprint like the ones we've named, but paved the way in our local communities and tribal areas. Decades and centuries before the term environmental justice was coined, they sought to keep the earth clean and water unpolluted. Just pause and silence for 30 seconds 
in prayerful remembrance. Amen. Again, we thank the United Church of Christ, American Public Health Association, and all of you who are listening and viewing tonight. Thank you. Thank you. For our closing keynote, I am honored to now introduce Latresa Adams, the founder, CEO, and president of Black Millennials for Flint. from our ancestors to speak truth to power today. Lifting up Dana Alston, Hazel Johnson, Wilma Mankiller, Gwendolyn Patton, Connie Tucker, and a host of other powerful ancestors who I have the esteemed honor of channeling today. Honoring our elders, Reverend Dr. Ben Chavis, Dr. Robert Bullard, Richard Moore, Charles Lee, Donna Chavis, Jean Sapp, Charles Cobb, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Linda Ray Murray, Cynthia Harris, Linda McKeever Bullard, Donnell Wilkins. There are so many more black and brown history makers that our country built by black and brown hands that are left out of history books, crafted by the indoctrinated white supremacists who not only ignore our contributions, but ignore our humanity. Despite the seemingly never ending fight against environmental racism, organizations like the American Public Health Association amplifies the painstakingly difficult truth of American history while constantly seeking restorative justice to heal from the atrocities and ecological violence against Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people. I am Latricia Danise Adams, pronouns she, her, and hers, the proud daughter of Roy and LaSharon Adams, a displaced African born in a city that I love in Memphis, Tennessee. My journey to environmental justice activism is not unusual, especially if you're one like me, who's from the African diaspora. What has brought us, black and brown people in particular, from grassroots to the White House is best defined with the Swahili word ujima, which means collective work and responsibility. Unlike the westernized thought of individualism and the every man for himself rhetoric, the original stewards of the land, Black, Latinx, and indigenous folks have an unshakable devotion to unity. While white America is reckoning with climate change, as we saw the topic live and centered during the presidential debates of 2020, Black and brown folks have been screaming from the mountaintops, stop killing us for centuries. From human chattel kidnapped from the Western shores of the continent of Africa to the false discovery of the Americas masked in imperialism with a stench of manifest destiny to the horrific reality of Europeans distributing smallpox infected blankets to the very people who taught them how to cultivate terrain unbeknownst to them, to the 15,000 uranium mines on tribal land, to the sanitation worker strike in my hometown of Memphis, Tennessee, where the, doctor, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King took his last breath to the life-threatening hookworms and other parasites in rural areas of Alabama with poor sewage and sanitation due to fecal contamination, to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, the Hurricanes Irma and Maria in Puerto Rico, lead in with the Flint water crisis, the Baltimore lead paint crisis, the lead crisis in Benton Harbor, Michigan, lead in school drinking water right in the nation's capital of Washington, D.C. To say it's been a long time coming is an understatement. 
the over 30 year fight of Peggy Shepard in Harlem, New York, the unbossed and unapologetic fight of Dr. Beverly Wright in Louisiana, the hope and promise of Mari Copany, who we lovingly know as Little Miss Flint. To me, the first and youngest African-American woman appointed to the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council by President Joseph Biden, my, 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 in closing with these words from my good ancestor, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to see a long life, but I'm not concerned about that right now. I just want to do God's will and he's allowed me to go to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I might not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm so happy. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And my good brothers and sisters, that is how we black and brown family have moved from grassroots to the White House, forever forward, backwards, never. Thank you.